This is the Lou Rockwell Show. It's great to have Stefan Kinsella with us today. Stefan is an attorney in Houston, Texas, uh, specializing in patents and trademarks. He's a writer. If you take a look at his archive at lourockwell.com, also his archive on uh, Mises.org, also the author of many, many legal books published in this country and abroad in his area of specialization. And today I want to talk to him about, about intellectual property, about the whole concept of government patents and government copyrights. He's uh, really enacted a revolution in this area among libertarians. But Stefan, before we get into that, you're in Houston. You're, uh, you've just had that horrific hurricane. Talk to us a little bit about uh, how comforted you are by Mayor White of Houston and other government officials taking care of you. <laughs> well, let me just say I'm, I'm here in Baton Rouge waiting for power to be restored and uh, um Nice to be with you, by the way. Um, but from uh, one of the things I've heard is the the curfews that the, the government is imposing to make their job easier, of course, to uh, just uh, automatically suspect anyone who's roaming around uh, of being a criminal automatically. So it's amazing that uh, people think uh, the government's doing a great job there. I saw Mayor White on television reminding everybody that the electric uh, lines were all owned by a private company. And therefore, of course, the government, which was entirely in control and up to snuff in every other area, uh, couldn't restore people's electricity because that was some of those awful, awful private firms. Right. Yeah. It, 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 they, they try to blame uh, any failure they can on the, uh, on, the, on the private sector, even if their fingers are all over it. Stefan, talk to, talk to me a little bit about intellectual property. I, I think you've pointed out that not only is it not property, but the concept is used by the government and by uh, private interests in order to infringe real property rights. Yeah, this is to me the most striking thing about it. Um, a, a lot of uh, libertarians and, and economists uh, sort of come to the come to the table presuming that IP is a legitimate type of property right. It's, it's one of these strange things where um, leftists oppose it because they assume it's property, and uh, conservatives and libertarians endorse it because they also believe it's property. And in a sense, both are wrong. Uh, the leftists seem to sort of sense this. Um, I'm not sure if they sense it really because of any perspicacity or because of their general hostility towards industrialism and commerce, and their assumption that this is part of it. But they, they sense something is wrong um, with the oppressive way these laws are used. But when you, when, when you step back and think about it, um, as I did a long time ago when I started practicing IP law around 92, 94, um, when I assumed that it was legitimate, having read Rand and other free market thinkers who sort of took it for granted, um, their justifications really didn't make a lot of sense. And the more you think about it, you realize that um, to enforce these property rights, these so-called property rights, you have to basically set up an intrusion, a system that intrudes into legitimate property rights that already exist. Uh, it's almost like the libertarians fall prey to this, the notion that liberals fall prey to, where they believe you can just create more and more positive rights with no penalty, without realizing that these rights dilute real rights, right? Like welfare rights are not free. They, they come at the cost of property rights because they require us to invade people's bank accounts and check, check paychecks and pay for these welfare rights. And it's the same thing with intellectual property rights. The more you prolifer- pro- proliferate these type of rights, they have to be enforced against physical property that already exists. So the primary case against intellectual property, in my opinion, is moral. Uh, it requires an intrusive state, state bureaucracy. It's basically a, a socialized uh, redistribution of wealth from existing property owners to another class of people favored by the state, a class of innovators or basically people that register the appropriate documents with the federal government. Stefan, I know that Murray Rothbard thought that Patents were illegitimate grants of government monopoly. But what about copyrights? You've shown that copyrights are as much an illegitimate grant of government monopoly as patents are. I believe Rothbard's uh, intuitions were heading in the right direction. What, what he was trying to do was he was trying to say that you could use some kind of private contractual regime, regime that would be legitimate to create some of the, um, the benefits uh, that people point to in a copyright or patent system. Um, and the example he gave, he gave an example of a mouse trap. Now, under typical IP law, that's an invention which is covered by patent. 
uh, Murray called it a, a case of copyright because he was thinking uh, the pattern of the mousetrap could be copied by you know, the, the buyer of the mousetrap. And basically his idea was that if you stamp it copyright, then you're putting the buyer on notice that he can't use it in certain ways. And I think actually that's correct uh, as far as it goes. But I, I think he did misstep a little bit where he, 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 uh, he extended that to cover the case of third parties because to do that requires, uh, requires the assumption that knowledge is also property um, because the third party wouldn't need permission of the second party, or the buyer or the seller, unless knowledge was property. If he's merely using knowledge that he gained from, say, observing the the purchaser's um, mouse trap. So I think that is the is the um, is the mistake he made there. He, and he he was basically trying to construct a contractual system, and I, I do believe that more work can be done in that area, and more contractual mechanisms could be uh, come up with that would solve many of the problems that uh, IP advocates uh, point to. The part of the problem, of course, is that the government outlaws a lot of the mechanisms that the free market would adapt or adopt to address these problems with antitrust law, for example. Uh, you know, if many companies got together to form a cartel to have some kind of uh, uh, protection uh, or some, uh, a way to address a free rider problem, for example, in a given industry, it would be a cartel and illegal under the antitrust laws. Um, so we can't see right now exactly what contractual mechanisms people would come up with. But certainly I think... I think uh, contractual regimes would be perfectly leg legitimate. And, of course, your, your monograph on intellectual property is available on Mises.org at the Mises.org store. But it seems like this is one instance in which the, the libertarians, the Kinsellan libertarians, have really got the people with them. I mean, is there anybody, is there any young person, is there anybody under 30 in the United States who, who takes the RIAA side against uh, copiers of, of music? I mean, it seems, to, and and or the M, or the motion picture associations, similar activities. I mean, these are hated organizations. They, of course, work in in cahoots with the government uh, to try to suppress copying of music and copying of movies. I I agree. It, it, it's actually striking to me uh, how uniform the libertarian uh, uh, sentiment is about IP, at least among those that are younger or that are tech-savvy, or that have any familiarity with, with Austrian economics or rough Rothbardian type libertarianism, which that is principled property rights-based libertarianism. And it appears to me that the RIAA is viewed almost like the IRS. You know, it's like no one knows anyone who works for the RIAA or the IRS. It's maybe some obscure third cousin or something, and they don't, they don't talk about it at, at cocktail parties too much. It's, it's, it's universally seen as being illegitimate. And uh, not only that, impractical. It, it, the RAA is widely condemned by almost everyone in the industry, even people that don't have a strident or a principled view on IP. They think it's, it's crazy what these guys are doing. They're destroying. They're they're going after their own customers. They're, you know, they sue twenty thousand people. Um, it, it looks like the flailings of a dying beast. I remember there was a, a one point at which Congress was preparing to adopt, and maybe they did adopt a uh, a plan. Um, the Republicans were pushing it to allow the movie industry, the, the record industry, to, um, to actually destroy people's computers, uh, to be able to reach into them with, with uh, in effect, their own viruses. If you had music or movies that they claimed you shouldn't have on your computer, that they would be able to, uh, for example, erase your hard disk. Yeah, I, I think that was, I think Orrin Hatch actually uh, advocated that. That was uh, the uh, evil Orrin Hatch. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a, a good Republican supporter of, of, of property rights, correct? So here's, I mean, here's what, of course, is obviously a criminal act, uh, the sort of act that the government is otherwise hysterical about, people who are hackers and, and spammers and that sort of thing. And yet, of course, the government not at all hesitating to use these tactics itself in defense of uh, the interest that it approves. Yes, I, I, I agree. It's, uh, uh, I mean, I think this is what you get when the government tries to outlaw essentially peaceful non-criminal activity, um, you know, if there's a demand for something, and then there is clearly a demand for the ability to copy. I mean, copying is a natural thing to do. This is how we learn, right? This is how we transmit information. The entire creative process, even in technology or in the arts, relies upon copying. That's what it's about, adapting and building in 
uh, you know, plots from well-known novels and plays and ideas that have been circulating in society for dozens or hundreds or thousands of years and building upon them. So copying is natural, and uh, as I think Cory Doctorow points out in a recent really insightful uh, piece, uh, copying is not going to get any harder. Copying is going to get even easier. I mean, the Internet is the world's greatest copying machine. And so the attempt to suppress copying is uh, going to require draconian measures that are uh, going to suppress people's liberty. And are ultimately going to be impossible. I think it will be impossible, especially as, as cryptography and uh, uh, encryption uh, techniques become more readily available and widely used. Uh, I, I think they're, which is going to result, of course, in selective uh, enforcement and imposing draconian penalties on a few select unlucky people uh, until hopefully the, uh, the specter of this will be so uh, so dramatically seen to be unjust that, uh, that it will just wither away or, or not be enforced too much. Stephen, just one last point. Where did Rand go wrong? I mean, I can remember her arguing that, if I can paraphrase in a sense, you know, that you were some sort of mystic of the muscle if you didn't believe that the uh, U.S. Constitution's view of patents and copyrights was exactly right, that you were a, a communist. But it seems to me she had very little argument for this. Well, yeah, I think there was a couple of um, uh, uh, missteps that she made. W one was, as you note, um, her sort of religious adherence to the American uh, scheme of government, uh, which was almost perfect in her mind. And only a, so she, she sort of took for granted that whatever the founders had a, had set up was correct, except you know maybe for slavery and a few, a few other matters. Um, and in fact, it, it, one striking example of that is Ayn Rand tried in her in her weak attempt to defend intellectual property, she tried to defend the practice uh, which is called first first to uh, file, which means the first inventor to file a patent application wins and gets the patent. Uh, so she had this contorted argument for why this makes sense, because she mistakenly believed that was the American law. Of course, it's not the American law. The American law is the first person to invent would win in, in the case of a contest, unlike the rest of the world. So th th that's just an example of her sort of uh, reverse engineering, I believe, is just trying to justify whatever the Constitution said. But I believe the central mistake is, is the sort of confused notion that creation is an independent source of property rights, um, probably stemming from the, the mixture of the idea of creation with economic prosperity and productivity uh, and homesteading and all these notions. Unless you carefully sort them out, you might be mistaken for thinking that creating things of value is one source of property rights. But if you think about it carefully, you can only create value with property that you own. And if you own the property, you already have the property rights. So the creation of value is just a way of transforming goods that are already owned. Um, so I believe that identifying creation as an independent source of property rights is similar to the idea, uh, similar to what liberals do when they try to create positive welfare rights. It's, it's just an additional right, they believe, but it has to undercut the already existing rights. And the same with, uh, same with basically uh, attaching property rights to creation as a right. I mean, basically, if you understand how the system works, it cannot work without a state, a legislature to create these schemes, and a, and a huge mass of government bureaucracy to administer it. It cannot. So anyone advocating patents and copyrights is, in effect, advocating bureaucracy, the state, and legislation, which are clearly unlibertarian, in my opinion. Stephen Kinsella, thanks so much for being with us. I want to urge everyone to take a look at his archive at lewrockwell.com, take a look at his archive at mises.org, read his book on intellectual property that's for sale at, in the Mises store, or you can uh, read it for free online in, uh, in a PDF. Indeed, you can just put uh, Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A, and intellectual property into Google, and you'll find out all kinds of great things. And let me also mention StephanKinsella.com, uh, his own site. Stefan is a pioneering libertarian theorist and uh, doing great work. And Stefan, thanks so much. Thank you, Liz. You've been listening to The Lou Rockwell Show, produced by LouRockwell.com the best-read libertarian website in the world. If you'd like to advertise on this podcast or on the website, email advertise at lewrockwell.com. And thanks for listening.